Our next speaker is the Vice President of Research and Development and Quality and Technology at Ocean Spray. He brought decades of experience in product development, engineering, manufacturing, and entrepreneurship with him when he joined Ocean Spray four years ago. Before taking on his current role, Eric was a senior executive assigned to the Lehigh, Lehigh Valley Project, the largest capital investment in the Ocean Spray Cooperative's history. Please welcome Eric Fritz. Good afternoon. While we're waiting for my presentation to load up, I will point out that uh, so Ocean Spray is a growers co-op, which is a rather unique economic model. Um, it started in Cape Cod in the 30s. Uh, three growers got together and decided to put an organization together to sell cranberries nationwide. And uh, they put their cranberries in sauce, distributed it nationwide, and ultimately uh, grew to a, about a $2.5 billion company and a global company at that. So I'm going to talk about uh, the food business and challenges in a global market, also innovation and how we... Okay, so Ocean Spray as a um, there we go so it's an 85 year old agricultural cooperative um, that was started by growers in Cape Cod it is still grower owned which is critically important to how we develop our business models and especially how we approach growth in our business uh, there are currently 700 cranberry growers across the U.S. in primary growing regions. Um, and cranberries, uh, two observations. One, if you're not, raise your hand if you're not familiar with craisins. Okay, so I would ask that whoever's closest to that table, teach them about craisins. So craisins are, um, used, are made out of a waste stream. So ocean spray, started as a cranberry company, canning whole cranberries, and then quickly got into the juice business, put juice in bottles. We were the first company that uh, made blended juices, cran apple, cran raspberry, cran grape, and the waste product of that was a hull. About 20 years ago, one of our scientists looked at that hull, which we used to sell for $4 a ton to cattle in New England, um, and said, you know what, we can make a product out of that, and that's how craisins were born. Now, urinary tract health in cattle has declined somewhat since then, but um, cranberries grown across North America. It is, uh, was the first product of the co-op, cranberries, and now we also are a co-op of Florida grapefruit growers. So we, we have sort of a split co-op between cranberry and grapefruit. In 2009, as we began to look after the first decade of trying to expand globally, how successful we were, um, Asia Pacific was an opportunity that we identified early on, um, and we were going to use our Western Europe model to go into Asia, which turned out to be a pretty significant error for us <clears throat> as far as growing our business uh, in, in the Asian continent. The Asia Pacific, we got it right after a couple of years and um, our strategy changed and now Asia Pacific is one of the largest uh, growth markets for us. I'm gonna split this into two categories, beverage and craisins. And beverage, which is by far our largest business um, accounts for about $2 billion in sales. And Craisins, which continues to grow at double-digit growth, accounts for about $500 million in sales worldwide. The juice category, <clears throat> so if you think of uh, the sugar wars and beverage and the things that we're faced with uh, in the beverage industry, uh, carbonated soft drinks are on the decline and other beverage alternatives are increasing. 
uh, one of those being bottled water. So when I started my career in the food industry a long time ago, there's two things I didn't think you'd ever buy um, in a container. One was water, because you had plenty of fresh water even if you had to drink it out of a sprinkler as a kid. And the other was salad. Whoever thought I'd, you know, you'd be buying salad in a bag. And I'm looking across the generation that was probably raised on those two items. As we look at how we grow in um, emerging markets, we have to look at what the expectations are and how to develop those markets and the thinking in those markets, um, juice being one of them. So uh, water is growing. Um, water is growing rapidly, but juice is right behind it. Uh, world juice sales in, uh, in liters uh, continues to grow. And juice growth by developing markets, you know, similar uh, map to what Jim had showed. And I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about where those markets are, but what I would like to talk about is how to create products for those markets and how to, uh, the difference of going into those markets, because that's, that's the key to being successful in emerging markets. None of them are alike. So I said earlier we tried to use the European model to go into Asia. Bad idea. Um, we can't even use the, the Asian model, um, which we've been reasonably successful at, in going into South America. So each one of those markets and market segments inside of a market are different. So the, the learning for us is um, and has been and will continue to be, and we continue to remind ourselves, is know your customer and then know how to get to your customer. So the biggest challenge for us as a food uh, ingredient or a food company or a juice company is what we call the last mile. We can identify the consumer, what the consumer would like, preferences, develop products for them, but the challenge for us is getting the last mile. How do we get to the store? How do we get products? We can get them into the country. How do we get those products to the shelf in front of the consumers? with enough shelf life um, to meet their expectations. So world fruit snacks, um, as I talked about beverage, continue to grow. Snacking um, in the U.S. continues to grow. It's been double digit for us, and it continues to grow um, in the world. Fruit snacks in particular, uh, the concept of eating your fruit in a uh, convenient way, in a portable way, um, has gained a foothold across you know, as, as even emerging countries become uh, short of time in their busy schedules, trying not to sound like an ocean spray commercial and the two guys sitting in the bog telling you how convenient it is, but it truly is. I mean, that, that go-to-market strategy works to get <clears throat> snacking in people's hands um, very quickly. Um, in our study, and these, these numbers are pretty consistent with what you've heard, 87% of the global packaged food growth in the next five years is going to come from uh, emerging markets, Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, the, two, the two biggest markets there are uh, Latin America and Asia over the last 12 months. Use of distribution. So as we look at models for distribution and how we go to market, this is MENA, which is our um, Middle East market, we look for partners that already have distribution that we can offset some of their fixed operating costs. So if you think of a truck driving down the road, you know, they have roads in emerging countries, um, truck driving down the road to consumers and a distribution point, a grocery store, um, it's, it's not always full. So we endeavor to partner with people like Pepsi or Procter & Gamble to help fill up trucks which reduces their operating cost and gets us to the shelf. So that's sort of an emerging uh, strategy for us. Once we get into a market, then we have to customize our marketing message for each market that we're in. So Justin and Henry in the bog, um, if you've seen that commercial, raise your hand. If you love it, keep your hand up. Justin and Henry um, are two icons that we created about seven or eight years ago to drive ocean spray products and the goodness of ocean spray products, um, urinary health track, uh, uh, urinary track health, 
and um, you know they've been an icon for us, but it doesn't work. You know, you put Justin and Henry in a New England bog in Australia, it doesn't really connect with the consumer. So we have to think of different ways to get to the consumer. And quite frankly, um, one of the things that has been consistent across emerging markets are our sampling programs. So getting into markets and providing free samples in malls and grocery stores and in universities has really helped us um, increase our, our exposure. And snacks in particular. Um, show me a college student that doesn't like a snack. <clears throat> the, uh, once we get to the grocery store, so introducing the product has a different vehicle in every market that we're in. Um, retail execution in the Middle East, you know, they like consistency, they like things big, and so we do what we call brand blocking, where Ocean Spray has a huge presence on the shelf that provides color and attraction um, for customers to get to the shelf. Now, in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia in particular, about five years ago, we put a strategy together that, and, and I, I want to make sure that I express the importance of understanding the market, the consumer, and the fluidity of some of these markets. So China, you know, double-digit growth, China, um, Southeast Asia, interdependence, a lot of things going on in, in geopolitics, um, and we have to figure out how, how to take advantage of things happening in that market. So there are two very large retailers in China. One is Costco, the other one is uh, Walmart. And so we made a decision about five years ago that we were going, we have a very strong presence with both of those retailers in the United States. That in Asia, we were going to attach ourselves to Costco and Walmart and as they drove business into the interior of China, we were going to ride along. Have you heard of Alibaba? So, <laughs> of course you have. So, um, what has supercharged that is Alibaba coming to the forefront and doing an IPO and just being incredibly successful. So, if you look at um, you know, it's about customers, it's about customer contacts, it's about understanding customers, and Alibaba certainly has perfected that in, in uh, Asia. So when Costco got together with online merchandising, they came to Ocean Spray and said, you're one of the fastest, this is, now I'm speaking of craisins right now, not juice, you are one of the fastest growing brands in our snack division in China would you be willing to provide some trade dollars to support a online sale during a week um, with Costco in Asia? And um, we couldn't resist, and it just blew the doors off of our production facility in Markham, Washington, um, who had to supply that market. And it was 10 times sales in one week, 10x. So just the ability to connect um, with a retailer that has strong presence um, on the ground, bricks and mortar in China, and who's connected with the largest electronic retailer, is a huge uh, event for Ocean Spray. <clears throat> so it was, it was even um, highlighted on CNN, a lot of publicity around how the e-commerce um, event went, um, how we display products, uh, meeting customer expectations when they walk into a supermarket market in China, end aisle displays or uh, mid aisle displays, um, all of that comes from learning about a market and having local representation in that market and making sure that we're, uh, we're right in front of the consumers with sampling and programs that, that were founded in the United States but have to be handled differently in, in other markets. Same thing with South Korea, entirely different market. Uh, in Asia, entirely different distribution system and different expectations, different flavor profiles. So as we go into markets and we look at them, you know, I'm, one of my responsibilities is innovation. Innovation, research and development, principal science, you know, how to put products together in the right packages for the right markets, um, understanding the needs of the consumer. So as we go into a, a market like South Korea, uh, the colors that they like, the flavors that they like, the 
What flavors are emerging from that market? What are the indigenous fruits or fruit company? What things can we latch on to to create products to meet the expectations of that market? Always understanding that our primary business is to sell cranberries. So it becomes very interesting how to combine some of these flavors with cranberries and very challenging. Monk fruit and cranberries. That's an interesting flavor. Um, in South America, we, um, these are actually PepsiCo representatives. So as we look at the markets moving south, um, Brazil, Argentina, entirely different markets, we wrestled with our go-to-market strategy. We used uh, Coke for a while on a distribution cycle. That didn't work. We ultimately landed with Pepsi. For Pepsi is growing in those markets, and we want to grow with them. Um, one of the economic barriers in exporting products to South America, especially food products, is the tariff structure of some of those, those countries becomes prohibitive to be able to economically place products in that environment. So three years ago, we bought a, James uh, referred to this earlier, three years ago we bought a cranberry growing, fully integrated processor in Chile, Lenco, Chile. And interestingly enough, some, some entrepreneurial uh, New Jersey Ocean Spray cranberry growers went to Chile, and if you know the, the um, environment in Chile, it's, it's vertical, so you can virtually grow anything. It's like, it's like California, only on a vertical scale, so you can grow wheat and grasses three times a year and then go up and grow coffee and cranberries are sort of in the middle. So some entrepreneurial growers went to Chile and started growing cranberries. Um, another entrepreneur came in and put a processing plant in place and then ultimately that scaled up. So there's a lesson here. Um, <clears throat> you know, be an entrepreneur, go into business, scale a business as far as you can build it and then spin it off or sell it but start selling it about three years before you actually expect to uh, divest yourself of it. So there's, that's the private equity model. So we're the buyers in this case. We go in and we knew that that was going on, cranberry growers growing cranberries. They're successful. They grow the market. They put a processing plant in place. We reach out and buy it. And now we're spending $20 million to expand it because the opportunities to take advantage of tariff relationships between Chile and other parts of the world is extremely compelling to us. But those are the sub, what's, what you see on the screen are the sub distributors for PepsiCo that we're riding along with in, in uh, South America. Marketing in Central and South America is entirely different than anywhere else in the world. Um, it's a happy event, it's a lot of sampling, it's a lot of um, hype, uh, dancing, and. I don't want to stereotype the South American market, but it's, it's lively, let me put it that way. And you have to be adaptable. You have to be able to understand that and adapt to it. Retail execution in uh, point of sale, Central South America, same thing, has to be pretty, has to be compelling, has to be attractive, and want to, want to make people um, come to a product that they're not necessarily familiar with. Okay. That's my story. I'm willing to take questions. If you have any questions, well, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll bring the uh, microphone to you. This is kind of a superficial issue, but um, on two slides ago, for your South American stores. Were your products in glass bottles? I'm sorry, speak up. Were your up. products in glass bottles in your South American stores? Um, great question. So Is that when you think of the P's in marketing, you know, if you've taken a marketing class, the product, the price, the promotion, and the, and the uh, container um, package, the package varies from country to country. Um, it's driven by a combination of what the local population expects what's worked in that country, what distribution systems are in place. Sometimes we're in plastic bottles, just like the U.S. Sometimes we're in Tetra Brick 
packages because people have gotten used to buying things um, in shelf stable uh, tetra packages like juice boxes um, so it, it varies we have to pretty much customize and then plus capacity um, some co-packers uh, that we may be using in other countries where we're not actually exporting to um, only have a certain style of package and we try and make it our own until we can build a facility or create capacity of our own in a, in a emerging market. Hi. Um, I just want to ask, can you explain? You're going to have to speak up. I, go ahead. Sorry, can you go hear me it. better? Can you hear me better? I can. Okay. Um, when you mentioned there was like a vertical thing you were talking about, like can you explain more about that? Like you were saying how cranberry is like in the middle of like coffee or like I don't know what that meant. I just want you to like, explain that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole question. Can you? Um, you mentioned that there was like a vertical growing like thing going on in South System in South America. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? The, the the vertical structure of South America. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So vertical um, generally is uh, implies that you're at every aspect of getting your product or service to the shelf or to the customer. So in this case, Vertical in South America um, referenced the Lanco uh, facility that we purchased or the Lanco business that we purchased, which is growing cranberries, taking those cran harvesting the cranberries, processing the cranberries, distributing the cranberries all the way to the shelf. So that's the vertical nature of that, that business flow. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, hello, so I'm here. I want to learn like how does the company manage the different relationship with like so many retailers like and wholesalers, like how, how does the company has to manage with like all the international retailers at present? Okay, so I believe the question was how do we manage our uh, partners in emerging countries basically because they're so diverse and yeah. they have so many different requirements and communications we um, and it and the answer to that is it de it depends on the market so in Europe um, we actually trans we rotate in the European market which goes all the way down to um, North Africa so all the European countries and some Middle East uh, places we have a person that was that is actually part of the ocean spray um, headquarters group in Massachusetts and we rotate those people generally through the office in Europe in Asia um, we've we've started with contract brokers so brokers who go that understand the consumer that understand the distrib distribution system, and so we they have knowledge of the market, and we send the products to them, and then they charge us a price for distribution. Ultimately, as those markets expand, they grow, they gain more, more revenue. Um, we will oftentimes hire those people as Ocean Spray employees. They become agents in that country for Ocean Spray. So it varies from from market to market. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about why specifically you chose Pepsi versus Coca-Cola in South America with, um, I don't know about all of South America, but in the Andes region specifically, I know that Coca-Cola has a dominant share with Inca-Cola, for example. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Pepsi, Pepsi in general has been a good partner for us in general. Um, Pepsi handles our up and down the street business. Up and down the street is single serve in universities because Ocean Spray doesn't specifically distribute to universities. So we had a good relationship with Pepsi. Um, you're right, Coke has a dominant position in South America and we tried sections of Coke, but quite frankly, Coke was too big for us, um, you know, and, and carrying 
300 cases of single serve cranberry juice on a truck of, you know, a thousand cases of uh, Coca Cola really didn't give us the attention we wanted. And we looked at other partners. Now, there are some parts of South America that we have very specific partners for very specific countries. But outside of that, in general, um, we found Pepsi wasn't as large as Coke. They have a desire to grow. Um, they're willing to invest in the infrastructure to make our type of products in, in South America. Um, they're interested in sharing um, trade spending and marketing dollars. And I showed Indial displays. Sometimes you'll see them sort of happening at the same time. We buy the same real estate or share in the cost of that. So there's a lot of a lot more partnering um, with Pepsi as opposed to having Big Brother, you know, sort of distribute your products. And if they make it okay, if not, we'll find somebody else. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, Hi. I was wondering, I guess, two pronged. So. Touching on the question that was asked before about how vertically integrated the company is, it sounds like Ocean Spray is pretty vertically integrated, not just in South America. Is that just, or that was just? Correct. And, okay, and then spinning off of that, I guess, in terms of future uh, markets or countries, continents, regions that you're looking to get into, what would be some? Can you highlight on that? Sure. Um, so vertical integration, Ocean Spray, is absolutely a vertical integrated company. And um, when I go back to the first slide, we're owned by 700 growers. So that, in, in the development of the culture of Ocean Spray and how we treat our partners, how we treat our employees is very um, much anchored in being a farmer. So that, that value spreads across our organization and across our business dealings. Um, you know, we have an incredible score on um, morals and we have strict policies on um, doing business in other countries and treating other countries the way we would treat business within the, United, the confines of the United States. Um, so the verticalness starts at the farm. Um, we, all, we all go to the harvest. Uh, it's an important event for us um, across the United States. We have a program called Bogs Across America um, where we build bogs to educate the public on the value of cranberries and eating, you know, one of the only three indigenous fruits in North America. So, you know, that's the verticalness and it goes all the way up. Um, the work I do for Ocean Spray is um, simply to enable the growers to better market and distribute cranberries. And that's, that's the goal. Um, in terms of markets yet to get into, um, you know, I listened to Jim about resurrection, so to speak, and, you know, sticking with it. A lot of times that's difficult to do, especially when you have a uh, product that is perishable. You know, cranberries eventually die, and uh, it's tough to stick into the market and continue to pour dollars into it um, if it's if the market is uh, heading uh, in the wrong direction. So, <clears throat> some of the markets that we've tried to play in in the past are going to be our our new opportunities to um, sort of restart those markets. Um, Indonesia, Singapore, um, you know, have been tough markets for us. North Africa is incredibly difficult. Uh, Pepsi has a strong presence in the Gulf Coast states, you know, from Dubai uh, heading down. Um, you know, they have, they have a pretty strong presence in nectars and fruit juices. So getting back into that market, we've tempted that um, on, on occasion. But now that we have a stronger relationship with with uh, Pepsi as a distributor, you know, maybe it's time to get back into some of those markets. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, that's all the time we have for questions, but um, you can ask Eric questions after the uh, last speaker. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.